Hi, my name is Becky Dame, and I'll be your moderator for this workshop. I want to welcome you to the workshop for Take a Breath, Managing Lung Problems After Transplant. Now it is my pleasure to do, introduce Dr. Aja Shadari. Dr. Shadari is the Medical Director of the Pulmonary Function Testing Laboratory at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center and is also an Associate Professor in the Department of Pulmonology. His research focuses on bronchiolitis obliterans disease, as well as other lung disorders after a stem cell transplant, and the novel approaches therapies to treat them. Join me in welcoming Dr. Shadari. Thank you so much. Um, it's really my privilege to be able to speak to you um, today about uh, lung problems after transplantation, and this will kind of go over a lot of the various lung problems that we uh, see after a hematopoietic cell transplant, particularly focusing on non-infectious problems. Um, and first, I'd like to, these are my disclosures here. Um, these are a couple of pictures of uh, Houston. Uh, this is uh, Buffalo Bio Park on the, on the top right, and then on the bottom is uh, MD Anderson, where I really have the privilege to work. It's um, a well-known well cancer center, and uh, it's really uh, my privilege to be able to work with all the folks uh, who uh, come through our doors. So um, with that, I'd like to start with the uh, learning objectives. Uh, on the right, uh, that's uh, the Astrodome, by the way, uh, once known as the eighth wonder of the world. And so <laughs> it's, it do doesn't look so wondrous these days, but it is one of the, the uh, uh, notable buildings in Houston. So um, the learning objectives uh, for today, uh, we will talk about the types of lung injury that can occur after transplantation. Uh, we'll talk about some of the risk factors for developing these types of pulmonary difficulties after transplant, um, some of the treatment strategies that we have, and then finally, how to find a specialist who can help us manage pulmonary difficulties after transplantation. First, I want to do something uh, a little bit fun. So this is a, a, a brief history of breathing. And so um, much of what we know about the lung in general is only uh, has only been discovered in the last uh, one to 200 years. So uh, early philosophers really recognize the importance of the breath. So for a long time, uh, it was thought that the soul resided in the heart, um, and uh, some, some thought that the soul resided in the head. And then finally, um, the Greek philosophers realized that there was uh, a great importance to the breath. Um, and so uh, it seems now that, there's, that, the, that the primary function of the lung, it's common knowledge that it's to deliver oxygen to the organs to exhale carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. But in the time of the Greeks, uh, none of this was known. And so Plato, for example, realized that breathing was important, but he thought it occurred through the skin pores and not through the, the mouth and the trachea and the lungs. And Aristotle thought that breathing, the only purpose for breathing was to cool the heart, uh, which, was, which he thought was the seat of the soul. Um, but even though they didn't know exactly how breathing worked and how the lungs worked, they realized that it was serving some vital purpose. Um, so on the right, you see uh, a famous uh, Greek named Galen. Uh, his full name is Alias uh, Galenus, and um, he really uh, figured out how the diaphragm works, and he's really well known today uh, for being an expert uh, uh, physiologist. Uh, and when you consider when he discovered these things, he was really way ahead of his time. Um, ironically, he was sort of forgotten by his immediate successors because he thought that the arteries and the veins of the body were two separate vascular systems, and they were not connected. Um, and it would be a long time before the pulmonary circulation was discovered, and they figured out how the arteries and the veins in the body were actually co connected, and of course, that's through the lung. So um, almost uh, uh, over a 1,000 years later, uh, there was an Egyptian doctor that discovered that there was a pulmonary circulation. Um, and it would be almost 300 years later when it was finally confirmed by an Italian named uh, Rialdo Colombo. Um, and finally, in 1628, a gentleman named William Harvey discovered that the pulmonary circulation connected the arteries and veins of the body. Um, eventually, uh, with the advent of microscopy in the 1660s, another Italian scientist named Marcello Malpighi discovered that there were pulmonary capillaries and alveoli. And then finally, in 1644, it was understood that air was matter and actually had weight and substance. And this was discovered by an Italian named Evangelista Torricelli and then eventually confirmed by Robert Boyle, who is famous for Boyle's Law. So in the context of human physiology, uh, John Locke 
reason that air was necessary for the proper functioning of the circulation. And in 1774, so now almost 2,000 years after the Greeks were trying to figure out why breathing was important, oxygen was discovered by Joseph Priestley. And it wasn't until the early 1900s that we realized that oxygen diffused into the lungs and was necessary uh, for that vital purpose. So the importance of the breath has been known for a long time, but exactly how the lungs work is a much more recent uh, phenomenon. So um, it, just to give you an idea for how much the science has changed in the last 100 years, it took 1,000 years to understand that blood circulated to the lungs. It took 500 years to understand that air was not just a vacuum but actually had matter. It took another 150 years to realize that oxygen was vital for human function, and then another 150 years to figure out how oxygen got into the body through the lung. So with that, we're going to talk a little bit about how the lung works. So you can think of the breathing cycle in this way. Um, breath is initiated by sending a signal from the brain to the diaphragm to contract. This is an involuntary signal, but of course you can signal when you want to initiate a breath voluntarily as well. Uh, the diaphragm contracts, and then it's, this expands the thoracic cavity and makes it bigger. And what it does is that it creates a negative pressure. And that negative pressure causes the lung to passively expand, uh, and then it inflates with air because the pressure now inside the lung is lower than the outside. And this continues until the lung reaches full inspiration. At that point, uh, you can either passively exhale uh, or you can forcefully exhale by using some of the other muscles. So ambient air enters the airways, and it uh, gets into these little sac-like structures called alveoli. And alveoli is really, this is, this is where the magic happens in the lung. So what happens here is that air gets into the alveoli, and the alveoli are very, very thin structures, the thin sac-like structures, and oxygen can readily diffuse um, from the air into the blood. And carbon dioxide diffuses uh, out of the uh, alveoli, uh, out, of the, out of the blood into the, uh, into the alveoli, and then when you breathe it out, you're breathing out a slightly higher concentration of carbon dioxide than you're breathing in. So carbon dioxide is a byproduct of uh, uh, normal metabolism, um, and it's sort of a waste product in this sense. And so it's very important both for getting oxygen to the blood, but also to make sure that you get the, the carbon dioxide out of the blood because that can have some bad consequences for your health. So why is the lung so important for hematopoietic cell transplantation recipients? So um, one of the things that's happened over the last 30 years, of course, hematopoietic cell transplantation is not that old when you consider um, how much work has been done to identify why the lung is important. Well. Uh, it's really impressive to think about that in the 50s and 60s, we've been able to actually transplant someone else's stem cells into your body uh, and cure certain cancers. And um, over the last 30 years, the mortality has declined quite a bit. But one of the problems that we've run into now is that um, pulmonary complications, and especially non-infectious pulmonary complications, uh, are becoming first and foremost. So as we solve some some problems, other problems uh, gain uh, greater significance. And these non-infectious pulmonary complications occur in about 20% of transplant recipients, and they increase the rate of death twofold. So uh, it roughly doubles your mortality. So these are really um, significant events that we need to work harder to prevent. So other than relapse, pulmonary complications are one of the biggest barriers to a healthy post-transplant life. And this, was, this work was best shown uh, by uh, Anne Bergeron, who is uh, uh, one of my counterparts in Europe. Uh, and she, she, showed that she published this in the, in the European Respiratory Journal in 2018. So there's a simple way to conceptualize non-infectious pulmonary complications. So you can think about when they occur. Um, and so this is a little bit arbitrarily defined as early, which is in the first few months and late, which is after the first few months, and then how if they affect your breathing as well. And so um, is, it, uh, is it an obstructive disorder? So is it hard to get air out? And this is sort of like diseases like COPD or asthma, or is it restrictive? Is it hard to get air in? And so these are diseases that we sometimes uh, collectively refer to as interstitial lung diseases. And so when you look at it in this context, uh, these are some of the diseases that we'll talk about today. So Early uh, non-infectious pulmonary complications include diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, idiopathic pneumonia syndrome, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, and pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. If we think about late, trans late complications, uh, once again, organizing pneumonia can really occur early or late. And then one of the most important complications, which is a focus of 
Uh, my, my clinical and research interest is bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome or lung graft versus host disease. So in terms of restrictive versus obstructive disease, bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome is the most common obstructive disorder. Um, most of the other disorders will not have airflow obstruction. So this is really important. Whenever we see a pulmonary function test that has airflow obstruction, that really raises the alarm to us that this could be new graft versus host disease. And as we will talk about, this is something that we want to catch early and we want to treat early. All the other non-infectious pulmonary complications are restricted, so this often presents with a lower lung capacity. This presents a little bit of a challenge to us, too, because it's hard to distinguish these from one another sometimes. And so we have to do tests like bronchoscopy, for example, to figure out if it's an infection or to figure out the type of inflammation. And then finally, there's one important uh, non-lung condition which can also sort of restrict the breathing, and this is truncal sclerosis or sclerotic GBHD uh, of, the, of the chest and chest wall. And so in this case, you can almost think of it like a tight rubber band around your chest where you can't take a deep breath in because the skin is basically keeping the lungs from expanding properly. Uh, and this can affect the lung function, and it can often affect the lung function quite a bit. But luckily, the skin has a greater regenerative capacity than the lung, and sometimes with appropriate treatment, we can get folks to breathe better even if they have significant sclerosis. So the first disease I'm going to talk about is diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. And so this is a disease that's characterized by bleeding in the lung, which is what the word hemorrhage means. And this usually presents with a difficulty with oxygenation. And the diagnosis is made with, an, with increasingly bloody return on the bronchoalveolar lavage. And here you can see in this uh, 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 picture on the right that if you look at the far left uh, vial, uh, the, there, the, the fluid, which should be clear, has a little bit of a pink tinge to it. Um, and then it, as you go from uh, left to right, you can see that it gets bloodier and bloodier. And so this is really a hallmark test for uh, how we diagnose uh, hemorrhage. And so the bronchoscopy, um, if you're not familiar with it, is a little bit like a, a, an end, upper endoscopy or a colonoscopy. Uh, we use a camera that has uh, that's at the end of a flexible scope. Um, and usually we go into the, the nose, um, but some people will go into the mouth. Uh, and we just follow the airways back uh, through the back of the throat um, into the uh, past the vocal cords and into the trachea and into the lung. This is usually done with conscious sedation with uh, agents like midazolam or fentanyl, uh, but occasionally it can be done with general anesthesia as well. It's a relatively simple procedure, um, but sometimes when people have diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, they have difficulty breathing, and therefore um, they may not tolerate the procedure quite as well as if we did it in somebody who's healthier. So this is what a CT of someone uh, with uh, alveolar hemorrhage looks like. Um, and the bleeding in the lungs can really be a result of low platelets, which are relatively common in the early uh, phase of transplantation, or um, radiation injury, which is commonly identified as a risk factor for alveolar hemorrhage. Um, we usually treat this with steroids, uh, and sometimes we'll use anti-clotting agents, but really the evidence for both of these is pretty limited. Um, and just as an aside, one of the reasons that um, we use steroids is we see alveolar hemorrhage outside of transplantation in folks who have autoimmune disorders. Um, but it's really unclear as to whether inflammation is the driving force behind all causes of hemorrhage in, after transplantation. And so there may be a lot of reasons that you have this bleeding in the lung, and it may not be the type of inflammation that we see outside of transplantation. And so one thing I would caution is to assume that those conditions are the same. Um, at any rate, this is a very serious complication, and we take it very seriously. We try to diagnose it as soon as possible, and we need to address it promptly. So this is something that occurs very early in transplantation, um, and hopefully by the time that you, um, that you uh, get to around day 100, this is not something that's uh, a consideration anymore. The next complication is something called idiopathic uh, pneumonia syndrome. Um, and idiopathic pneumonia syndrome uh, is called that because idiopathic means we don't know the cause, but it looks like a pneumonia. Um, and this is a pretty severe non-infectious pulmonary complication that occurs usually in the first few months after transplantation, typically in the first three months. And it looks like a severe infectious pneumonia, but by definition, there must be no evidence of infection. Um, one of the interesting things is that the, the word idiopathic pneumonia syndrome um, comes from a time before we had widespread 
PCR testing for uh, viral reactions. So you, you might be familiar with PCR testing uh, now that in the COVID pandemic, uh, that's one of the ways that we confirm the diagnosis of COVID. And what the PCR test does is it basically looks for genetic fragments and it amplifies them and it matches them to see if they fit uh, the genetic signature of certain viruses. Um, and we have panels that have uh, a limited number of viruses. And as we started to use those, we realized that some of the cases that were idiopathic pneumonia were really uh, these types of viruses. But more recently, there's some evidence that it could be due to a human herpes virus, which is, um, uh, these are of course like herpes simplex virus, which causes cold sores, but there's several of these viruses. And one specific one is called HHV6, which is not known to cause uh, pneumonia in in the in in humans, uh, but more recently, this is something that was identified in almost half of cases of idiopathic pneumonia syndrome, and it's something that we more uh, increasingly recognize as a pathogen. So, the way we define idiopathic pneumonia syndrome is uh, this: these are the ATS criteria. So, you need to have alveolar injury, um, and the way we uh, define this are multi-lobar alveolar infiltrates with symptoms and signs of pneumonia. So you have to have shortness of breath or hypoxemia or, or something like that, and new lung restric restriction or hypoxemia, which means low oxygen. Um, and you must not have any evidence of respiratory tract infection or cardiac or renal dysfunction, because if you have problems with your heart or kidneys, you can have fluid that spills into the lungs as well, which is also can look like this type of idiopathic pneumonia. Um, it occurs in about 3 to 4% of hematopoietic cell transplant recipients, so it's a relatively rare disorder. Um, and the uh, major risk factor is myeloablative conditioning. So this is when you have a higher intensity conditioning to try to eradicate the cancers. Um, it's associated with a very high mortality. Um, nearly 70% of people who develop this will die within a year of transplantation. Um, so it's something, again, that we take very seriously. Um, and the treatment is high-dose steroids, and there's some data for uh, agents like etanercept, which is an uh, inhibitor of an inflammatory cytokine called tumor necrosis factor. But the truth is that this is something that we need to work harder to understand better and to be able to treat better. The next disease I'll talk about is pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. This is a very, very rare uh, non-infectious pulmonary complication, and the incidence is so low that I'm not sure I can quote you an accurate, accurate uh, incidence. Um, what happens here is that you have scarring of the pulmonary venules, and venules are small veins, um, and the symptoms include shortness of breath and hypoxemia, and there's usually a skin rash with some weight gain or swelling that occurs around the time of PVOD. Um, there's some limited data on drugs that have been used in hepatic veno-occlusive disease, which occurs more commonly, and this includes a drug called defibrotide. Um, but this is another very rare condition, and even in PBOD that occurs in the general population, the treatment is often unknown, and in some cases, that those patients require lung transplantation. Luckily, this is something that occurs very, very rarely. We see it uh, um, very, very uncommonly. Um, because the mortality is very high, and we don't want anybody to get this. And unfortunately, because it's so rare, uh, we have a lot of work to do to understand wh what drives this and how we can prevent it. The next one I'm going to talk about is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. So this is something that occurs a little more commonly now. Um, it occurs in about 1% to 2% of transplant recipients. Um, and uh, we understand a little better now that this often occurs after a viral infection. So respiratory viruses often precede this organizing pneumonia. Um, this is something we noticed uh, at MD Anderson uh, as, a, as a common risk factor. And I think it's really clear now in the, in the public eye that uh, viruses can cause this type of reaction because this is one of the common reactions that occurs after COVID-19 as well. So COP manifests as a slow onset of shortness of breath usually preceded by a flu-like prodrome. Again, that may be because of the respiratory viral infection. But unlike the other things that I presented so far, uh, COP generally responds to steroids. Most of the cases are steroid responsive. So the way we treat COP is uh, we start steroids, and we usually uh, treat for about 8 to 12 weeks. And the reason we treat for so long is that if you taper off the steroids too soon, you might get recurrence of the organizing pneumonia. There are rare cases of severe COP, and we might have to add additional immunosuppression like mycophenolate mofetil uh, or Celsept, but the data is very limited. Luckily, most cases are very steroid responsive. And so when we see this promptly, 
we can treat it, we can often reverse it and minimize the amount of scarring. Uh, in a minority of cases, we do see significant scarring. And so uh, this is, again, something that uh, we take seriously, but luckily uh, it's something that we can, uh, uh, we can treat um, quite successfully. The last disease I'm going to talk about is bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. Um, so this is graft-versus-host disease of the lung. This occurs in about 5% of transplant recipients um, and as many as 15% of patients who have some other form of GVHC, most commonly the skin or the gut. Um, the prognosis of patients has drastically improved in the last couple of decades because we understand the disease better, we screen for it better. Um, but if you diagnose this disease late, the mortality rate can be nearly as high as 80% 10 years after diagnosis. And so, again, this is something that we take seriously. We want to catch early. Um, and, and the earlier we catch it, the better patients do. The two major risk factors for bronchiolitis of blood ants are GVHC of another organ or respiratory viral infections. And um, one of the interesting things with the COVID pandemic is we saw fewer cases of BOS. And it could be, and this is, this is just really just an anecdote, but it could be because there were fewer other respiratory viruses that were passed um, in the community. Um, and why viruses trigger BOS is not entirely clear. This is something we're actively looking into, along with some colleagues of mine, uh, to identify why viral infections seem to trigger GVHC of the lung. So this is a pretty busy slide, but this is the NIH criteria for diagnosing bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. Um, and I'm just going to break it down in a way that's a little more, um, little more manageable. And so the first thing we look for is evidence of airflow obstruction. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, Bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome is the only obstructive NIPC, um, and so we look for uh, a ratio of how much you can blow out in one second versus how much you can blow out in total, and we try to see if that's less than 70%. Most of the time, that number is 80% or higher, so once you get to 70%, you're often sort of at the lower fifth percentile of the population. Um, and um, if you're below that, we consider you to have airflow obstruction. We also uh, mandate that you have a decline of at least 10%, uh, that should read 10% over two years. So um, the FEV1 should not correct to greater than 70, 75%. Um, this is, uh, again, these are the NIH criteria. Um, one of the downsides of requiring a threshold of 75% is that it makes, uh, it potentially introduces a delay into the diagnosis. But if you move that number higher and higher, you're going to get more and more false positives. So it's a trade-off between what we call sensitivity, which is our ability to pick up the disease, and specificity, which is our ability to rule out things that are not the disease. Um, in the case of BOS, uh, we also require that there's no active infection, and this is because certain infections, particularly viruses, um, can cause airflow obstruction, which is transient. And this is, again, a challenge because viruses are a risk factor for BOS, but they can also create a bronchiolitis, which is uh, trans transient and uh, um, not the same as lung GVHC. And finally, we either look for air trapping on CT or we look for air trapping on the pulmonary function test. Um, if someone has extra pulmonary chronic graft resistance disease, and this is a vast majority of patients, um, then you don't need one of those two features. But if you don't have extra pulmonary gra chronic graft resistance disease, the NIH actually recommends that you get a biopsy. And uh, I won't get into details, but a biopsy is a little bit controversial, and it can be associated with a lot of side effects. Um, diagnosing BOS early in its course is generally better. Uh, in other words, when we catch patients who are less sick, um, those patients often do better. Um, whether that's causal or just association is not entirely clear, but it seems like it's relatively reasonable to suggest that screening for this disease better could lead us to treat the disease better. But why can't we diagnose early BOS consistently? You know, what is the problem where we're not screening as well as we could and some patients come to us with more advanced BOS? So one problem is that it's really hard to diagnose BOS because the symptoms are quite subtle. It can be hard to distinguish shortness of breath and fatigue from other conditions like, uh, like just post-transplant fatigue, uh, anemia, uh, or viral infections, which are pretty common in the first year after transplantation. Pulmonary function screening, um, most places do it on a schedule where you get two or three tests in the first year. So for example, at MD Anderson, we get tests at day 100, which is about three months after transplantation, and then at six and 12 months after transplantation. 
Um, one of the things that we just published and showed, uh, and I don't have the reference here because it was just accepted last month, but the rate of testing drops substantially in year two. Um, but the rate of lung GVHC um, really increases uh, at about 9 to 12 months after transplantation. So it's almost like we take our eyes off right as the rate of BOSS is going up. And this is something that I hope we can change in one way or another because just as we stop to test for uh, for uh, pulmonary function testing, uh, the rate of BOSS actually rises. And, and we test more frequently at a time when the rate of BOSS is relatively lower. Finally, there's no way to diagnose this with chest imaging other than some advanced techniques uh, which you may uh, read if you're familiar with the literature called PRM or parametric response mapping, and there's some other techniques as well. These are not really ready for the clinic yet, and so this is something that if you look at a CT, it's not going to pop up at you as well. And so this is something that could really fly under the radar until it becomes a big problem. So the mainstay of treatment for BOSS is systemic immunosuppression and inhaled corticosteroids, and we used to use something called FAM, which is fluticasone, which is kind of used as a stand in for a general inhaled corticosteroid, um, azithromycin, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and then finally Montelicast, which is a drug that is often used to treat allergic types of inflammation. Um, more recently, there's been some concerns that azithromycin might cause uh, or increase the rate of cancer relapse. Um, this is based on a study, again, by Anne Bergeron, my colleague in France, who showed that azithromycin, which was given as at the time of conditioning to prevent BOSS, actually resulted in a higher rate of relapse and also, in, in a, um, unfortunately, a higher rate of BOSS as well. And so she's doing some work to figure out why that happened because it's not entirely clear. Um, we often consider second-line therapy, so there's a couple that we often use here, like ruxolitinib and belimosidil. Um, but one thing that's really clear is that um, the second-line therapies that work well for non-lung GVHD typically don't work as well in the lungs. And so the lungs, uh, they're a little bit rare. They're not as therapy responsive. So this is an area that I'm very interested in to figure out how to treat refractory BOSS. Finally, if you have BOSS, ask your doctors about pulmonary rehabilitation. This is basically like exercise. Um, and the way I phrase it to patients is this. So um, what is pulmonary re rehabilitation? It's a multimodal approach where we improve aerobic conditioning uh, so we often have folks uh, work out on the treadmill or on a bike, um, and we kind of mix it up a little bit, too, so you're not getting used to the exercise. You're sort of keeping your body uh, constantly improving. We also do stuff to improve muscle strength, so, for example, uh, uh, light weights or resistant bands. And we also do things to improve balance as well to uh, kind of restore some of the function of the body. Um, this is almost like having a personal trainer. Um, it, it, we teach patients based on where they are and where we think they can get and where they want to be. Uh, and then finally, we kind of help them to cope with the symptoms of shortness of breath as well. This is pretty time intensive. It requires two to three sessions per week. Usually it's one to one and a half hours, and it may require up to six months of, of therapy. But um, the, the data is quite limited uh, in, uh, um, in hematopoietic cell transplantation, but in a small study, uh, uh, patients with BOSS, uh, 10 out of 11 who did lung or pulmonary rehabilitation after hematopoietic cell transplantation uh, had better physical function and less shortness of breath after this. And this should not be surprising because even if we can't get the lungs to improve, we know that exercise improves the muscles. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about screening for BOSS in the digital age. So um, I've started to use some home spirometers, again, mostly in a research setting, but we would love to see this in the clinic. Uh, and we're working to see how we can get this paid for by uh, insurance companies so we can really roll this out on a large scale. And so both I and Guangxing Cheng, my collaborator at Fred Hutch uh, Cancer Center, have shown that home spirometry is easy, it's reproducible. Uh, and more recently, we showed that it, it, it's, uh, it, it can be cost effective. When you consider the cost, this is just the economic cost. Of course, the economic cost is not the most important thing. The most important thing is the impact on patients' lives. But even if we had to just reduce it to economic cost, bronchiolitis obliterans is a very expensive disease when you consider the resources that we invest into, into a hematopoietic cell transplantation. And again, this is a bit of a dispassionate way to look at it. Uh, the most important thing is how patients feel and to get them to feel better. But if you had to put it in, into economic terms, um, if you develop BOSS, that comes at a huge cost uh, to payers. And so if we can find ways to screen for it, which costs a fraction of that, 
um, then I hope that we can show that we can really develop and use modern technologies to screen for BOS in a way that's uh, more comprehensive. Um, so we can do this lung function monitoring more frequently in the home. Uh, we send folks home with, home, uh, with a, um, spirometers that um, pretty much could fit in your pockets. They're tiny little devices. Um, and usually if we see a 10% drop, that often indicates a real drop, but we have to have people come into the clinic at that point and make sure it's not infection or weakness or some other condition. So we've gotten pretty good at teasing this out, but at the end of the day, we still have to have a face-to-face -face encounter to kind of confirm it. Um, but this is hopefully the wave of the future, and I think COVID showed really the benefit of doing telemonitoring and telehealth type strategies. So what are the costs potentially, uh, or what are the potential downsides of home spirometry? Well, there is a cost, so we have to convince payers to, to, that this is important. I hope we can convince them that it'll save them money, and, and I, I'm very convinced that it'll improve uh, patients' lives. Um, also, there is some burden on patients. It takes about five minutes per session, but I know that transplant recipients have a lot to worry about, and this is just one additional thing. Uh, we also don't want to overdiagnose BOSS because, as I showed you, BOSS is hard to diagnose. We don't have great biomarkers. This is something that I, I work hard on. Uh, but it's something that uh, is not ready for prime time yet. And so until we prove that these biomarkers work, we don't want to overdiagnose BOSS and cause undue distress to, to patients. Um, it's also hard to arrange proper follow-up. Again, these are all solvable problems, and these are problems that should not discourage anyone from uh, from doing this sort of thing, but sometimes trying to get folks to come from far away and, and see a pulmonologist is difficult. I would argue that all of these are solvable and that home spirometry is something that we should widely implement uh, in transplant centers. And finally, um, I would encourage everyone to find a, a good neighborhood pulmonologist. If you live near a cancer center, you should see a pulmonologist that's affiliated with that cancer center uh, because you want to see someone who sees a lot of transplant recipients. There's a lot of unique things to consider, and it takes some nuance to understand. I know when I first started here at MD Anderson, it took me probably about a year or two to really understand all the nuances. And even then, it's still a continual um, uh, learning process. It's something that we can always get better at. So if you can't do that, these days we can do televisits. And so try to see if that's a possibility as well. And then also look for somebody in the GBHC directory and see if, that can, if we can help to coordinate you with a pulmonologist close to you or even see you in our clinic. Um, I, and I, I'm really committed to uh, helping folks uh, prevent and treat this, this condition. So with that, I'd like to open it up to uh, questions uh, with the help of our moderating team. Thank you, Dr. Shadari, for the excellent presentation. Um, we will now take questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Our first question is, um, Dr. Shadari, what is the most important thing to do and get lung G to do and get lung to GVHD better? Yeah, this this is a great question, um, and I think it relates a little bit to the the question below as well. Can damage to the lungs be reversed and improved? And so these things go a little bit hand in hand. And so. Um, when we diagnose lung GVHD early, sometimes we catch the airways um, where potentially we can get some lung function back. Um, but the longer it goes on, the harder harder that is to do. And so um, sometimes we can get to a point where um, uh, we can keep the lung from getting any worse, but we can't really get the lung any better. Um, and I think this has to do with the fact that the lung really doesn't have a lot of airway stem cells when you compare it to other organs like the gut or the skin. So when we think about an injury and recovery from injury, um, the lung and the airways uh, really don't recover as well as the skin uh, and other organs. And so um, sometimes uh, lung GVHC doesn't really get any better, unfortunately. And this is a, you know something that's very vexing to patients and, and a big challenge for us as well. Um, and so um, in those cases, we try to keep it from getting worse, but is there something that we can do better? And again, I would point to pulmonary rehabilitation. So. Um, we, we I'll, I'll give the analogy of COPD. In COPD, when, when folks smoke, um, the lung um, often doesn't recover to where it was before. and Sometimes it doesn't recover at all. But in those cases, we have a wealth of data showing that pulmonary rehabilitation uh, not only improves patient symptoms, but it can improve outcomes like uh, COPD exacerbations and hospitalization. So it builds reserve. 
it's exercise. So even if the lungs aren't getting any better, we can improve the muscles. You can think of the muscles as the real engines of the body. And so the more efficient the engines are, the less you have to use your exhaust system, which is, which is your lungs. And so um, with pulmonary rehabilitation, we can improve um, uh, vascularity in the muscles. We improve blood flow to the muscles. We improve the, the efficiency of the muscles at a macro and all the way down to a cellular scale. And so we don't uh, work the lungs quite as hard for doing so if we have a given unit of work. For example, if you wanted to take a shower or make your bed, these are things that we often take for granted until our lungs have issues. Um, we can make that easier by improving the muscular strength, even if the lung function has not changed significantly. So that's what I would say is that if you haven't tried pulmonary rehabilitation, I would strongly encourage that to you. It's like exercise. And, and really, um, when you think about side effects and risks, it's, it's about as low risk an intervention as you can, as you can conceive. So I believe you just answered this question, but do, so do the specific lung exercises help more than general exercise like walking? So, yeah, so um, some of the lung exercises that we do, um, so I guess we, we can do, divide this up a little bit. So, you know, the lung is not really a muscle, and so there's certain breathing exercises that can help calm the breath and reduce shortness of breath. Um, but the diaphragm is working all of the time, so you're not going to get really, um, when the diaphragm is not atrophied uh, or strained, it's hard to really get it to be any more efficient than it is because it's already working at full steam. Um, on the other hand, um, the muscles are not. And so general exercises like walking or biking, these are really great exercises for someone with lung GVHD. So um, I would say that when we talk about lung exercises, the breathing exercises have value uh, to, to reduce shortness of breath and try to help uh, when you when you feel like you're, you you have breathlessness, uh, but in terms of the greatest value to prevent breathlessness, I would say that aerobic exercise like walking or biking is 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 really uh, great. Perfect. Thank you so much. We have another question. I believe you've already answered this too, right at the end of your um, presentation. Uh, so there are some home devices available for PFT testing by the patient. Yes. Um, so, um, you know, this is something that I, I would really like to see where um, patients don't have to spend a dime to get get it, and we would just take care of the cost. Um, that's a little bit of an aspirational goal, goal right now. Um, it's something I'm uh, actively working on. I've been working on it for about two years now, and um, uh, I think we're making some progress. I'd really like to roll it out at MD Anderson this calendar year. In the meantime, we have had patients purchase their own spirometers. Uh, I review their charts. Um, we use uh, an electronic medical record where patients can send me those as an attachment. Uh, sometimes they've emailed them to me. Um, so I've monitored patients in that way. Um, it's just not as reliable as having a central system. And so a central system, we can do things like we build in alarms so that I can I can review, um, you know, hundreds of patients, uh, potentially, uh, and do it in a way that it's not consuming a ton of time, uh, so I could do it quite efficiently. Um, that's the kind of thing that you want to see, because um, at the end of the day, you want you want it to be something that doesn't add any financial burden and as minimal a time burden as possible onto patients, and so that's, that's the way that we're sort of envisioning it, and um, hopefully... Um, uh, we will have, um, you know, we'll, we'll make some progress in the next couple of years. And it, it just says in the side, this is something that the lung transplant community has been doing for like 30 plus years. And so it's definitely something we can do. Um, so um, I, I think uh, it's something that we just need to work and find a way uh, to make it happen. One of the, the, the patients or caregivers with us today are asking, if there are any immune suppression medications which can make pre-existing asthma or COPD worse? Um, so um, not, not that I know of. So I, let me just make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. The question is, can some of the immune suppression agents make asthma or COPD worse? Um, so in, in general, no. Um, and in fact, um, some of the agents are... Um, used to reduce the amount of inflammation in the body. Um, and to an extent, that's kind of how we treat asthma and COPD as well. Um, 
Now, I will say as an aside that immunosuppressive agents can increase the risk for viral infections. And we know that viral infections are a trigger for worsening asthma and worsening COPD. So these are uh, these cause what we call exacerbations of those diseases. Um, and uh, even the common cold is well known to be a risk factor for asthma and COPD exacerbations. So in that sense, immunosuppressive medications can predispose you to viral infections, which even if they're relatively asymptomatic in terms of the actual um, sort of upper respiratory tract infection symptoms, those can trigger exacerbations of asthma and COPD. But I, I don't think they can directly worsen asthma and COPD um, outside of that effect. So on the same line, there's another question that if you're already taking monolucas for asthma, does it re reduce your risk for BOS? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, uh, this is something that I, I know there's at least one of my colleagues is working on. Um, uh, it, the, the, you know, the introduction of Montelukast is based on data from lung transplant that, you know, even in lung transplant, it's not the, clear whether it works in all patients or, or how it works. And so it's something that um, uh, I think people introduced uh, uh, when they introduced FAM because at that point we didn't have a great way of treating BOS. And so it was sort of like, let's try to figure out how, how to block all the known sources of inflammation that could be happening here. Um, so Montelicus was used in that way. Uh, it has not been studied on its own. Um, nor has it been studied in a way where you randomize Montelicast to placebo and you give somebody inhaled steroids and you see if there's any additional benefit with Montelicast. Um, this is something I know one, one of my collaborators is, is looking at. Um, but um, as far as I can tell, um, you know, the, the main effect that we see from FAM is with the inhaled steroids with the Montelicast, um, I don't think is the main effect. Um, and I, I don't think there's anything to suggest that Montelicast could prevent BOSS at this point. Um, it is a it is a possibility, but it needs to be uh, tested um, more systematically for me to be able to answer that. Um, so, I I would guess no at this point, but I couldn't give a more definitive answer than that. Um, one of the questions is, what's best for treating the chronic cough that comes with BOS? Um, that's a great question. Um, so, um, cough is one of the most common common symptoms that occurs after um, uh, BOS. And um, there's really two, there's, I'll say there's three sources of cough that, that are worth considering. The first is airway inflammation. So this is similar to like asthma. When the airways are inflamed, they're more likely to be twitchy and, and, and uh, spasm and cause cough. And at the end of the day, cough is sort of like a spasm of the airways. And so with proper immune suppression, um, often the cough can get better, um, but um, sometimes people are still coughing. A lot of times it's because when you have lung GVHC, you make a lot of mucus. Um, so one of the things that I like to do, which um, I, I will say as a caveat, does not have, um, a spe you know, there's there's no scientific evidence to say that this, this works at this point, uh, but there's a lot of clinical evidence. Um, and there's also evidence in other diseases like cystic fibrosis. So I, I like to use a nebulizer with hypertonic saline. So it's just salt water, 7% salt water. It's kind of a neat story. It was discovered in cystic fibrosis uh, because um, surfers who are in Australia um, had better clearance of their lungs. The cystic fibrosis, if you don't clear your lungs, your lungs get a lot worse. And so um, we use this same kind of 7% saline. It's almost like the sea breeze to give the mucus a little more volume and help people cough that up. And so when we clear the lung of mucus, we can sometimes reduce uh, the, um, the the feeling that you need to cough something up. So I will say that hypertonic saline, 7% uh, saline, um, often with albuterol beforehand, because in some folks you can get a bit of a bronchoconstriction or, or airway tightening effect, um, that can help with the cough. And again, um, that's something that should be proven more scientifically, I think, but I think there, I've used that in the clinic now for several years. Um, finally, there's some new agents for chronic cough that um, are being tested. Um, they're not really ready for prime time yet. Um, but I do think that this is something that, um, you know, the, chronic cough is one of the toughest problems for a pulmonologist to, to uh, solve because most of the time if it's easy, they, they would have already been uh, treated by somebody else. So by the time they see a pulmonologist, you know that it's probably not your usual case of 
chronic cough. And so there are agents that um, are being tested that are, uh, hopefully we'll have more information about soon. Um, and perhaps one of those will be useful as well. So if it's not just a mucus or an inflammatory thing, maybe we can cool off the nerves a little bit and keep people from having that urge to cough. So, um, you know, I, I would just say stay tuned for that. But for now, if you're not on a nebulizer with 7% saline, that's something that I would talk to your pulmonologist to try. Thank you. Um, we have a question about one of the newer medicines. What have you seen about Resoroc that was just FDA approved uh, approval for BOS? Um, that's a great question. So that's, um, uh, you know, it's a pretty uh, novel method of inhibition. It inhibits something called ROC2, and so it's got some anti-scarring effects as well. Um, and, um, you know, there's a 30 to 40 percent response rate based on the Phase three data with, with Resuroc. Um, you know, it's um, – we talked a little bit about this uh, when we wrote the NIH guidelines a couple years ago. And – um, sometimes we talk about response to stability or, or getting a little bit of lung function back, but um, where we would like to be eventually is to have reversibility of this and try to get folks back closer to the normal range. Um, in, in my experience, when I use Resuroc, uh, a lot of times we see stability. We might even see a little bit of improvement, but we don't see a dramatic uh, change like the way we do in some organs. Like, for example, in folks who have severe skin GVHD, I've seen dramatic improvements with uh, with the Belmosido, but um, uh, I, I don't see that type of dramatic improvement in the lung. I don't think it's necessarily the fault of Resuroc or, Jack, or, or Ruxolitinib or any of these other drugs. I think it's really a fundamental issue with the lung's ability to regenerate itself. And so um, what I hope is that in the next 10 years, not only can we halt the inflammation and reduce some of the scarring, but maybe we can figure out a way to get the lung to regenerate a little bit. Um, and so that's something that um, we're, we have some very early uh, phase projects looking at that, um, but I would say that um, if those were at the bedside in 10 years, we would have we will we'll be doing really well. So they're not they're not uh, really close enough to even talk about at this point. But I I do think that's the way to kind of repair the lung is that not only do you have to stop these inflammation and scarring, but you really have to help the lung kind of heal itself. Thank you. We have another patient who's asking, if you are over two years out and have chronic GVHD, do you have to worry about lung problems? Um, that's a great question. Um, so if you look at when patients develop GVHD of the lungs for the most part, for the most part it is um, usually um, around year one. So right around 12 months, the median time is 12 to 18 months. If you develop it a little earlier, um, that often indicates a more severe lung GVHD. Um, but there's a long tail, too. And so um, it, just going back to my home spirometry program, the way we've sort of envisioned it is that we're going to watch patients uh, for three years. Um, now, the three years is a little bit arbitrary because uh, most of the risk is probably in the first two years, and uh, risk the, the risk in year three is probably lower than year two. Um, but then the, there's a long tail as well. We've seen folks develop lung GVHD four or five years out. The rate, of course, gets lower and lower and lower the further you go out. Um, but there may be no specific cutoff where we say, okay, you're safe forever. I think at three years, the risk is low enough that you can give people the peace of mind to say, um, we've watched you during the highest um, period of, of uh, risk for boss, and then after this, um, it doesn't mean that there's zero risk, but the risk is much lower, and so, you know, you can stop worrying about this and stop doing this weekly spirometry. Um, but at two years, I would say the risk is still – the risk in year three is, is still high enough that I would suggest um, monitoring for at least three years. Uh, but, again, that's more at the level of expert opinion based on when we know that BOSS occurs. <clears throat> Do you feel that a patient with asymptomatic MAC, MAC, who also has BO, should not be on erythromycin as part of the FAM protocol? Um, that's a great question. So we've done a couple of studies to look at this. And so, you know, one of the things with that FDA black box warning is that the azithromycin was done at the time of conditioning. So that means that it was given at a time that we typically don't use azithromycin. So we looked back and said, okay, um, you know, we give azithromycin typically for lung GVHD or the treatment of infections, 
These occur later in the re- course of transplantation when the relapse risk is much lower than at the time of conditioning when you freshly, you know, uh, treated folks and uh, induced a remission and you feel like this is the time to uh, start the transplantation process. So the risk of relapse is much higher then. So in a period where the risk of relapse is lower, do we still see the same effect of azithromycin? And so, um, and this is uh, lower quality data than the original data that led to the black box warning because these are retrospective studies. These were not randomized controlled studies. But um, uh, Guangxing Cheng and Ann Bergeron, who published the original finding, showed that when you give azithromycin for BOSS, um, the the risk uh, of uh, there's there's no additional risk of relapse. There was an additional risk of mostly secondary malignancies, which, is, as I recall, were mostly skin malignancies, and they did not increase the risk for death. Um, in our cohort, we showed that generally speaking, there's no increased risk of relapse. Um, we did see an increased risk of relapse in patients with unrelated donors or who and who were treated with anti-thymocyte globulin. So maybe there's an effect with the T-cell depletion where the azithromycin, which we know has some immunomodulatory effects, reduces the graft-versus-leukemia response. Um, and so, um, you know, we stopped using azithromycin altogether. But at the end of the day, the decision to treat MAC is, um, is something that um, it's a bit individualized. And one of the reasons that it's individualized is that um, – when you use an azithromycin-based regimen to treat MAC, it takes months to eradicate MAC. And so you have to commit to that azithromycin. And so we often treat MAC only when we are worried that someone's lungs are getting chewed up uh, with a disease process called bronchiectasis, where the airways are actually being damaged. And in that case, the risk of letting that go on is greater than the risks that we typically attribute to azithromycin. And this includes the pretty low risk of relapse, uh, depending on of where you are with MAC treatment. So um, I guess the way I'd phrase it is that if we're worried that the MAC is is so active that it's chewing up the lungs and causing problems, um, then we would prefer to prevent that um, at the cost of what's likely to be a very low but probably not zero risk of relapse. Um, the relapse um, uh, data, again, um, it, it would be really nice if we had better data uh, looking at the use of azithromycin um, when we actually prescribe it for infections and transplant it. Um, and so um, I, I still cite my data and, and uh, Dr. Chang's data um, with a little bit of a grain of salt because these are retrospective studies and there's a lot of biases uh, that go into them and you can control for most of them, but probably not all of them. And so, um, you know, I would say that the risk of relapse uh, is non-zero, but it's, it's likely to be very low. Thank you so much. Um, and then we have another question, on a little bit different. Uh, this one is a 69-year-old post-allergenic transplant in 2018. They had a pulmonary effusion that needed to be drained while inpatient. They're asking what caused that, and they also are asking, uh, they were diagnosed with uh, sleep apnea um, after two years, and are the effusions and sleep apnea related um, now that he's on CPAP? Okay. Um, so, um, it, I, so it, I guess uh, the question is whether the effusion could be contributing to sleep apnea, just so I understand the question uh, fully. He had the pulmonary effusion in inpatient and now has sleep apnea and wants to know if it is, it's associated to the transplant. Perfect. So, um, let, let me try to answer this question. So, one of the things with um, sleep apnea is that some folks may be sort of on the borderline where if their lung function is totally normal, um, they may not have apneic events, but then perhaps um, with some loss of vital capacity, um, they sort of drift into the point where they're getting hypercapnic episodes and apneic episodes, um, and they might even see their oxygen levels drop. And so the way we test for sleep apnea is we measure something called the apnea hypopnea index. Um, this is something that um, uh, is um, – it's not a perfect tool to diagnose uh, uh, sleep apnea as, as a caveat, but when it's combined with breathlessness, it's, it's often a good way to determine if somebody has apnea or not. And um, post-hospitalization, um, uh, sometimes there's a higher rate of sleep disturbances uh, for a variety of reasons. And then when you have a total effusion, 
Um, that can often tip people to where their vital capacity is a bit lower, so their ability to ventilate at night is lower, um, and they may have sleep apnea for that reason. So in that case, the effusion may be connected to the apnea. Um, generally speaking, um, most folks with effusions don't have new onset apnea, but in somebody who might have been on the borderline or the cusp of that, then it is possible that the effusion kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of push, push you over the edge, I would say. So, um, you know, that's something that potentially um, could be managed by a pulmonologist. Thank you. How, a patient is wanting to know how can they distinguish between BOS and worsening asthma or COPD that was already present? Um, this is a great question, uh, and it is something that is it, incredibly challenging for us. Um, so, um, uh, when you look at some of the earlier data, um, there, when you have asthma or COPD before transplantation, that increases the risk for BOS after transplantation. When we try to look at this data re retrospectively, so when we look at uh, all our patients who develop BOS, we have to look really carefully to see if they had any evidence of asthma before. Um, and then we have the benefit of hindsight, of course, because this, this, this happens, so we can see what happens when folks are treated. Does the lung function go up and down like an as a patient with asthma? Do they have a significant history of smoking? Practically speaking, we look at the pre-transplant pulmonary function, and we talk to patients. So if they have a substantial burden of smoking and we see pre-transplant airflow obstruction, they come to us with an, with an exacerbation, we might treat that with a course of steroids and see if it's a COPD exacerbation and have very close follow-up. Um, but that can look exactly like new onset BOSS, too. So we look for some other clues. Like if we see a lot of air trapping where there wasn't air trapping before, well, that sort of points us to more of a small airflow obstruction, which could be more consistent with BOSS. Um, if we see that someone has uh, up and down lung function uh, over several time points, we might conclude they have asthma, particularly if they have a strong history of asthma. Um, one of the saving graces is that um, inhaled steroids work for all of these conditions, so we often will prescribe the inhaled steroids and perhaps a course of oral steroids, and we'll just follow them up very closely in these cases that are somewhat uncertain. Uh, it is a challenge to distinguish it because, as I mentioned during the talk, there's not a specific biomarker for bronchiolitis obliterans, particularly one that can differentiate it from asthma or COPD at this point. So that's something that I, I think uh, we, we as a uh, scientific community need, need to work on. But at this point, I'll say that there's some clinical clues that can help us distinguish it, um, but they're not good enough for us to be 100% certain. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shadari, for this excellent presentation. Um, and this is, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So on behalf of the BMT Infonet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Shadari for his helpful remarks, and thank you in the audience for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT Infonet if we can help you in any way. Enjoy the rest of your symposium.